<laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I'm a long way from home, and of course, along the way, I picked up a cold, so please excuse my voice. Um, but I'm so pumped to be here. So I'm here to talk about getting the right research participants, which doesn't always seem like the most exciting of talks, but turns out that it's really important to have great research participants for quality research. So Dana was specifically talking about user research, but it's really important to have good participants no matter what kind of user experience research you're doing. And I know, because I've asked a lot of you, um, that each of us has had a situation where there was some kind of serious failure with participants. Uh, I put out sort of the back signal to a bunch of my friends and colleagues and said, guys, I'm going to UX New Zealand. I'm so excited. Tell me your worst, funniest story about participants. Um, and I got some doozies. Someone's ex-spouse showed up. <laughs> Not me, fortunately. Um, someone had their wallet stolen from a participant, uh, which was also just dumb, because they knew exactly who he was and where he worked. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I had someone tell me that they had recruited a single person, an entire team of 12 showed up for the session. Um, I had an old colleague of mine, we both worked at a um, tech e-commerce, uh, it's called Staples, I'm not sure if it's big here, it used to be big in the States. Um, but they were using a recruiting company, and a serial participant showed up two weeks in a row thinking that she was going to be testing a facial cream moisturizer at Staples, which made no sense. Um, and so those are kind of some funny examples of having participant fails, but um, it's not always that egregious, and it's not always funny. Sometimes, in fact, it's rather boring. Uh, so this is a tax form from the United States, and in the States, the taxes are quite complicated. And a couple of months ago, I was doing <clears throat> some usability testing on some software that helps people file and pay taxes. And we had, with the client, created this big, long screener, and we had used a recruiting company, and we were feeling quite confident about our sessions. We also had not a single no-show, which was impressive, over five days of usability testing. Um, but we got to about the third participant, and there was this one form that no one could find. Now, to be fair, there were some serious issues with the software that we were testing, but we couldn't tell if this particular form was just really hard to find, if it was poorly labeled, if the navigation just wasn't good. And about the fourth participant, we realized that although we had recruited tax accountants, only one very specific type of tax accountant ever used this form. Wasn't that something we had ever considered to ask in our screener? Um, and so, even though we had all these great participants, we had no idea, actually, if our findings from the usability study were that this thing really isn't findable, or they just weren't findable because our people didn't know what it was. So, um, what I'm going to kind of walk you through today, some steps for really finding the right people that you need to talk to, and kind of the steps to make sure the right people are recruited and show up to your sessions so you get the best quality research. So, the first thing you need to do is really define who you need to talk to. Probably not a statue. <laughs> uh, and the first thing you really need to do is kind of look around. What is the context of what you're going to be studying? Um, what Are you sort of in a, a startup situation where you're not even entirely sure who the users are? Do you work at a big company that has a lot of existing users and existing product? Uh, you know, kind of what, what is the context of the research you're doing? And why are you doing that research? What are you trying to find? And really kind of first, that seems like such an obvious step, but a lot of people skip that when they start talking about participants and they're just excited to get people in the door. Um, but really having a clear focus about who you want to talk to and what stage of the project you're in um, can help you kind of narrow down who you want to talk to. Um, and a really good way to kind of narrow down if you have an existing product, an existing set of personas, um, is that you I already have this all kind of defined. Um, I recognize that personas are a bit of a controversial topic at the time. Um, my personal hypothesis is that if you think personas are useless, you've probably not used them correctly. But that's a talk for a different day, so we'll move on. <laughs> um, but if you have personas already, then narrowing down who you want to talk to is 
pretty easy because you already have all this defining information about either your existing or target users. Even if you don't have personas, you can still do something called a proto-personas, and you can identify some key identifying traits. So um, a proto-persona is really just an exercise with a bunch of assumptions about who your personas might be. They're popular in the kind of lean startup and uh, lean UX and actual functions, but basically, you just kind of take a piece of paper, fold it in half twice, um, poorly sketch, if you're me, <laughs> or if you've got more skills, you make a nice picture, and just kind of sketch out some assumptions about core behaviors, key defining characteristics, and any kind of background or contextual information. And it's okay if this is a guess at this point, because um, you know part of your research might be to find out who these people are. But you need to at least talk about and think about and get on the same page with your colleagues and your um, teammates about who it is that you're trying to talk to. And if all else fails, you need to figure out who you do not want to talk to. I, I hate clowns so much, so I'm going to move along quickly. <laughs> um, so once you kind of have that stage set, where you're very clear about who you want to talk to, you want to translate all of those things into a screener. And I get lots of questions about screeners. They seem to be this kind of scary thing that people are unsure exactly how to, to approach or get started with, but I'm going to tell you a little secret. Um, a screener is basically just a survey. <laughs> um, and really, all you need to do to create a screener is to follow the best practices of good survey design. Uh, and by the way, yes, that is my dog. His name is Bromer. Uh, he sends his love from North Carolina. <laughs> um, so we're going to kind of walk through some of the specific things from survey design that can help you really create a great screener. So the first thing is to ask precise questions. Right, so this question, which snack is most delicious and nutritious? You've got some options here. Well, a carrot is probably the most nutritious, but who here thinks a carrot is the most delicious of those options? Okay, what, mm, really? Oh, all right, well, I, didn't, I don't think so. <laughs> um, but the key is really to ask one question at a time, right? This really should be two questions. What snack is most delicious and what snack is most nutritious? Because there's two different answers. Um, and sort of a general theme that I'll keep coming back to is that people really want to answer your questions and they will always make something up, right? So um, if they think that you're a cookie company and you want to be talking about cookies, they'll probably pick cookie. Um, or they just want to be able to answer something because they've signed up to fill out this screener. Um, they want to be helpful, so they'll just pick something, um, and that's not always what we're going for. Um, so you also have to make sure that you have precise answers to your questions. So if you ask someone how often they shower, and one option is every two to three days, and another option is every three to four days, but someone showers every three days, what do they pick? No idea what I do. Um, I do promise, however, that I showered this morning. <laughs> um, and you also need to make sure that you're precise in terms of what the answers actually mean. So if you say, how often do you go to the grocery store? Not that much. Sometimes. Often. Pretty often. Really often. Super often. What does that mean? <laughs> um, if you ask uh, one of my friends, who's a really busy single mom, um, she might say often and mean once a week. If you ask my husband, who is like allergic to the grocery store, he probably thinks that he goes often, but he really goes like once a week. Um, so be really specific and clear. Don't let, don't make people have to guess here. It would be much better here to do something like once a week, every day, multiple times a day, more or less often than that. But be really specific and clear about the, what those answers are. Um, and make sure that there are appropriate answers for everybody. So if you asked me, are you sassy, classy, or bad, see? Um, I'd probably say that, <laughs> right? But there is no all of the above option, and that wasn't a multiple select question. Um, so that leaves people who feel like all three are true without a true answer. Um, and similarly, there might be someone who's like, ah, I have none of those things. Um, so make sure that you always provide 
an all of the above and a none of the above answer. Because again, people will make stuff up. They want to answer you. Um, they want to give you something. Um, and they'll, they'll pick something probably. But if you really only needed sassy people, and someone chose sassy because that's all they had, um, then you might not really end up with the right people. And, and make it really easy to answer the question. So um, this, of course, is not ambiguous. Have you bought a television in the last month? That's a big enough purchase in a short enough amount of time that most people can probably remember that, and that's all good. Um, however, you don't want it to be too easy, because really, what you're asking is, would you like to be in our study? And <laughs> the answer, if they are this far along in a screener, is always yes. So if you make it super obvious what you're looking for and who you would like to talk to, you might end up with people who just want to take a study or just want to earn the extra dollars or whatever. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. So a better option, if you've got something specific that you want to ask about, is to make there be multiple answers so that it's not that clear what you're looking for. Um, you can also have multiple correct answers to sort of obfuscate what you're looking for. So um, if you're really looking for someone who has two or more Apple devices, if you just say how many devices you have, zero, one, two or more, um, people will probably kind of guess that two or more might be some kind of cutoff that you're looking for. Um, and instead, you can kind of add multiple correct answers so that it's more clear. Or maybe you want to talk to both people who have no, no Apple devices at all and people who have a whole bunch. So you can make there be multiple correct things. And more important than anything with a screener, you want to prioritize your questions. So it's really not very nice to ask someone 25 questions and then on the very last question, screen them out and have them not be appropriate. Um, so I really recommend putting the disqualifying questions at the very beginning of a screener. And um, there is some sort of debate about do you want to ask some of the kind of like intro questions, like demographic stuff at the beginning to help people feel comfortable. But in a screener survey, you really don't need to do that because really what you're focused on is just identifying who you do want to talk to and who you do not want to talk to and being really clear about that. Next, I have been waiting to use this picture in a slide for so long. <laughs> uh, this is a, a warning sign from the zoo in London. Uh, if you can't read it, it says, please do not touch or feed the animals. They sometimes bite. And it's Norman Nine Fingers with a, a bloody finger. Um, hopefully there will be no blood in your screeners, but you do still need to be careful um, because a screener can accidentally um, kind of put someone in the, in the wrong state of mind. You really want to consider what you really actually need to know about a person and what's important for when you're screening them. So do you really need to know someone's gender if they're going to be in your study? Maybe you do. Maybe you're talking about pregnancy things or whatever. Um, and so you really need the participants to be women. And in which case, that's OK. Um, but in a lot of cases, that doesn't really matter. Um, so what you want to do is kind of be careful and, and ask really only questions that you need to know. And then additionally, maybe give some people some context about why there's that question being asked, like, hey, where, you know, kind of once you've gotten through the, um, the question, say, hey, we're looking for people to talk about X, Y, Z things. This is why it matters that you are a 30 to 39-year-old woman with two kids or whatever. Um, and this also goes with the sort of careful warning, goes to the making sure that there's appropriate questions and appropriate answers for people. So if you're going to ask something like gender, um, make sure that you have enough options for everybody to answer so that people don't feel like they have to pick something that doesn't really fully represent them. And remember that a screener a lot of times is your first interaction with a participant. And sometimes they're existing users of a product or service, uh, but sometimes they are brand new to your brand. And this might be the first time that um, they're ever interacting with you. And you don't necessarily need them to love you. You don't need to be super warm and super engaging, but you need to be careful um, about kind of setting the tone and setting the right expectations. So not only being kind of careful about how you word the questions and that sort of thing, <coughs> excuse me, but being careful about, as part of the screening process, 
tell people, you know, kind of once they've made it through, what kind of sessions you're looking for, how long might those sessions be, um, and being really careful about setting expectations so that people continue to have a good experience with you. Because in a lot of cases, it's the first, first time they might interact with you. <coughs> so when you're talking about writing screeners, um, kind of keep these, these rules in mind. So you want to follow the standard rules of survey creation, prioritize the questions to, in order to disqualify people early on so that you don't kind of lead people on. Ask really only what you need to and make sure that there's appropriate responses. And then remember to set the stage for a good interaction in the long term. Okay, next. You've identified who you're talking to. You're, you're, you're really clear about that. You've written this great screener survey. Now what do you do with it? <laughs> How do you find those people to take that screener? Um, there's a lot of things that you can do, and I'll kind of walk through some of those options and some of the pros and cons and just things to be aware of. Okay, so bad news. Um, recruiting can be tough, and it's helpful to know that going in. Um, but good news, <laughs> you have lots of options. And uh, so one thing that I really always recommend that people do is that if you have an established user base and existing users, it's really helpful and awesome to reach out to those people with whatever communication channels that you already have. So um, if you have a, a social media presence, you can post something on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, if you have an existing you know, kind of email communications, there are all kinds of ways that you probably already communicate with the people that use your services. Um, one of my favorite ways to do this is if somebody contacts support and they have a specific question or, um, I don't know, an issue with a particular thing, uh, depending on how that call goes or how that in support interaction goes, uh, we'll ask people or have account managers ask people if they want to be contacted in part of research. And if they say yes, um, you can put a digital version of your screener together and send them that, that digital screener. But So it can be a little bit funny at first if you have existing users to figure out the, the best touch points. But my advice is not to create new touch points, just utilize the touch points that your company already has. Because chances are that there's already a lot of people at your company in various roles um, talking to users in, in various ways. <coughs> Um, next is that even if you don't necessarily have users, but if you have some sort of digital presence and a lot of visitors to that, um, you can digitally intercept people. So this is a picture of a tool called Ethneo, um, which is really great if you're not familiar with it. You can insert a little piece of JavaScript onto your site and you can recruit people uh, right from there. But you can also do this with um, any number of one of those little pop-up surveys at the bottom, which have their pros and cons. <laughs> um, but Again, digitally intercepting people is really just a way to kind of, if you're already interacting with people in some way, or if they're already kind of visiting you or using your services, um, you can find ways to touch base with them. And one of the great things about talking to people who are already your users is that, um, especially if you're working on like an enterprise or internal product or something that has a lot of specific required knowledge, um, you know that they already have it, and you know that they're truly, authentically a user, or at least a visitor, of your services and your site. All that is great, however, um, there is a caveat to that as well, which is the halo effect, which is um, somewhat complicated, but essentially boils down to whatever feelings someone already has about your service or product or offering, they'll bring with them to research sessions. So. If um, they contacted your support team because they're really unhappy about something that they don't think works quite right, and then you invite them to be a research participant, uh, beware that your research session may potentially turn into a venting session. <laughs> um, I have certainly been in that situation, and it's not always great. Um, but the good news is you know that their frustrations come from an, an authentic place. Um, the flip side of the halo effect is that if somebody has a really positive outlook on, again, your brand or your offering of some sort, they are likely to overlook things that are reasonable, authentic feedback. And they won't even know they're doing it. They're not doing it on purpose, um, but they will kind of play it off. So if anybody knows, you know, there's this sort of standard, like, watch what people do and not what they say. 
How many people have been in, say, a usability test, watched someone fail flagrantly for minutes on end, and then you ask them their experience, and they're like, oh yeah, it was great, I loved it. <laughs> right? Yeah? Okay, good, I'm not alone. <laughs> um, but so the, the thing about the halo effect is that probably those people, A, they kind of want to um, please you as the researcher, but B, they probably already have kind of a good experience with uh, your product or service, and so they kind of carry those positive things too. So you just be aware of that when you're recruiting people who are existing users. They're going to come with um, sort of their existing biases in, on both negative and positive end. And a small pro tip, which is that I highly recommend making your own panel or database of participants if you have existing users. Um, and if you have an existing CRM tool within your company, um, you can utilize that, and that's great. At one company I worked, we used Salesforce, and so we were able to customize the pages and add the screener um, questions and answers onto sort of custom fields, and that was really awesome. Most places will not let you do that. <laughs> um, so instead, you can just have like a spreadsheet of some sort. And this is a blurred out version of one from a recent project that I was working on. But just take a, a little bit of notes about kind of, you know, their contact information. Um, I think it's really helpful to make note of if you've got personas, kind of try to identify which persona they are in and make note of that. Um, and also some notes about, say, last time they were in a study or what their, um, less topic of study was. Um, so that, for instance, if you're changing a, a feature or a product over time, you can go back and reach back out to the people who've already seen a version of something and get some um, ongoing feedback from people who are seeing different iterations or different versions. Um, and the, the flip side of that is that you don't want to include the same, say, 10 people um, in all of your feedback sessions for a really long product. So you want to make sure that you don't reach out to those people over and over again because you want to make sure you get diverse feedback. Okay, so what if you don't have any users? <laughs> what if you're brand new? Um, well, one really great place that we are now fortunate enough, lots of tools have their own panels of participants. So this uh, should look familiar to many of you. This is a screenshot from Optimal Workshop. Um, and we're really lucky now that a lot of these tools are allowing you to do some screening of yourself so you can um, duplicate the questions that you put together in a screener um, in their services. And also they'll do um, some sort of validation of the participants. So if you get someone through who like claims that um, you know, they, are, they have purchased this thing and they know about this software and whatever, and you get them into the session and it turns out that that's probably not true, um, most kind of good tools will, um, will refund you or help you find more participants. So, um, of course, Optimal Workshop is not the only group that has um, their own participants. There are tons of online tools, tons of options. Um, I am mentioning here a few, especially if you're in different locations. Um, so Netizen is one that is um, popular in Southeast Asia. Um, Testasso, sure I'm saying that wrong, <laughs> um, is one that has a lot of Brazilian participants, so I've used them when I was doing research there. Um, User testing has uh, a lot in Europe and in the States. Similarly, um, usability has in what users do as well. So um, there's no one panel that's right for everything, and each of these tools does a different thing as well. Um, but they're really helpful, especially if, let's say you live here in New Zealand, and maybe your client is in Italy, um, but the people you really need to talk to are in California. Um, these online tools are really awesome for when you've got a widespread team and when you're doing um, remote research. And unfortunately, not all of us are lucky enough to go into the field all the time. Um, and sometimes we have to kind of reach out to people um, remotely to do some of this. With some of those panels, it can be a little bit hard to get really specialized users, like say doctors or lawyers um, or that kind of thing. But it's really great for when you're doing sort of general population work um, and especially when you need really fast results. Um, so if you do need some of those kind of really detailed, um, specific knowledge or specific types of people that are hard to recruit and you don't have your own users already, there are tons of professional research panels. So um, their whole business model is based on having a big database of people. Um, and they screen everyone themselves. They have tons of information about them. They'll reach out for you. Um, they often even handle the incentives, which we'll talk more about in a moment. Um, but they 
tend to be expensive, so uh, you just have to kind of make sure that you've got budget for that if you're going to need that. I see people taking pictures, I can pause. <laughs> Um, okay, and then the next thing that you can do is the live intercept. So this is the traditional guerrilla research tactic where you set up shop in a cafe and you accost, I think is the word, <laughs> uh, intercept people um, to see if they want to give you some feedback. Um, and this, again, has pros and cons. It can be awesome if you need to get feedback quickly, especially if you've got um, you know, sort of a general purpose tool or service that you don't need really specific feedback for. Um, but um, for one thing, it can be really awkward to intercept people. Probably they're at that cafe um, because they want coffee. <laughs> so unless you're doing research about the coffee purchasing service, you might get people who are like, no, leave me alone. Um, the other thing to just be aware of, um, and I will pause this for a minute, the other thing to just be aware of is that if you're talking about sensitive topics, especially um, sex, money, health, politics, those sort of things, you probably don't want to interrupt people in the middle of a lobby and ask them about that. Um, so just, just be cautious. Doing some guerrilla research um, and doing guerrilla recruiting can be really awesome, but uh, there are definitely some situations when it makes the most sense and when it doesn't. So, I've been through a lot of options, and here's the thing, people always ask me, I'll go through all of this, and, I'll, and they'll be like, cool, so which one's best? I don't know, depends, <laughs> right? Standard UX answer depends on the context, depends what your budget is, depends what the project is you're working on, depends what kind of feedback you need, all that stuff. So um, I made this handy slide, don't worry, I'll share the slides. Um, and I totally broke all the rules of slide design because there's a lot of words here. Um, but the, the point here I'm making is that there are different contexts in which it makes the most sense to recruit different ways. And there is no one sort of source of recruiting that makes the most sense all the time. Um, there are sort of pros and cons and best uses for each of these things. So yes, take your pictures. I will share them later. <laughs> Feel free to come ask me. All right, great, so you have put together who you're trying to talk to, you've put together a screener, you've tracked these people down, you've invited them to a study, and there's a reason at the beginning, at the um, talk, when I was talking about that tax software usability test, so when I mentioned that I had no-shows, because that never happens. <laughs> there's always no-shows, and that's okay. Some stuff is bound to be expected, um, but there are definitely some ways that you can set yourself up for best success to make sure that people show up. And so the first thing, and I mentioned this a bit before, but is set really clear expectations about sessions. And this is true whether this is a moderated session and they need to come into your office or meet at a lab, or if you're going out to see someone, or even if it's you know, sort of remote, unmoderated testing. Be really clear about how much time is expected from them um, when they need to be there, what they're going to get in return, all that stuff. Um, and don't be afraid to send reminders. Um, this is a not very busy week for me on my schedule. I'm sure I'm not the only one who has weeks like this, and probably our, most of our participants do too. I'm never offended if someone sends me a reminder to an appointment that I have. In fact, often I'm like, oh, didn't know that. Um, I will be there, right? So don't be afraid to send reminders. It's Totally okay and expect them. Um, but more importantly, make sure that you accommodate their time and their feedback and the sort of effort that they're giving in by providing an incentive of some kind. So providing feedback to someone is essentially a social exchange, right? They're giving up some of their time, they're giving up their knowledge, and in order to kind of prime them to do that best, you want to give them something. Um, now, most of us probably think incentives, and we probably think cash or gift cards. And that's true. Um, that is often a common one, but it doesn't have to be. Think about what your users might value. So recently, I was doing um, some work with a nonprofit that works with young women who are computer science majors. They're all college students. They were more than happy to get a nice dinner and some ice cream bought for them, <laughs> right? So um, just think about your users, just like you think about how you design something for your users or how you write for your users or whatever. 
Um, think about what they might value. Think about what shows and demonstrates to them that you valued their time. Um, and keep in mind that it doesn't have to need money, right? So I mentioned the food. Um, another project I was recently working on is um, with a big, big software group, and they have a lot of really loyal, dedicated users, and they gave out t-shirts. And I was like, t-shirts? I have like 8 million of those. I don't need more. But their users were super psyched about it, and we ran out of um, test session times, right? So just keep that in mind that um, just try to think about what your participants, what users would value, and how to provide something then to, that shows that you appreciate their time, appreciate their effort, et cetera. And OK, fine. Most of the time, that means you give them cash, um, cash or gift cards. It, it's true, and most people just appreciate this. So I always get the question, how much? Um, and once again, the answer is, mm, it depends. Um, depends how long the sessions are, depends how easy it is for people to get there, and most importantly, it depends um, how much kind of value I think their time is worth. Um, so for instance, I am a consultant, so I am exceptionally aware of how much my time is worth now, um, and if someone offered me $10 to come to drive half an hour, to talk to them for an hour, and then drive half an hour home, I would be like, yeah, cool, thanks, but no. $10 isn't going to cover that. Um, so sort of my rule of thumb is that the more general information you need, so if you're doing something like an online shopping, um, you can probably pay a fairly small amount and get really general population people. The more specific knowledge that you need or depth of expertise you need, um, the more you have to pay people. So again, the answer is, I don't know. Um, but just kind of think about your user base and what, what might be good for them. And keep in mind that the appreciation doesn't stop with an incentive, right? So people really like knowing that they had an impact on the product or service, especially when you're working on enterprise products or products with long-term um, long users and over time. <coughs> so a couple of things that I do here to help people feel like they've made an impact and that they had some importance and that we really valued their feedback is in those same communication channels where I might ask people if they want to be interested. I might say in a, in a newsletter for an old company I worked for, um, we would say thank you to you know, Steve, Joe, Bob, and Anna who participated in our test last week. Look at the stuff we just changed. And so when we did release notes, we would say thank you to all the participants. Um, and that's like such a simple thing and was so easy to add, but so many of those people contacted us and were like, oh, so cool, that was me. Um, and it's a, it's a simple thing, um, but, and like I said, this is especially true if you're working on like internal tools or enterprise systems or um, things that aren't necessarily um, tied directly to um, sales or kind of outside attention. And one last kind of piece about the incentives. Um, all of that information is still correct for longitudinal studies, um, but there's a big fat caveat, which I have to say, which is usually uh, you pay people at the end of um, sessions, whether they're interviews or usability tests or whatever. Um, with longitudinal studies, I like to kind of prime that social exchange, that give and get, and give people about a third of the money up front, um, depending on how long it is, maybe a little something in the middle, and then pay the rest at the end. Because um, once you've paid people, even if it's just a little bit, they'll feel a lot more mm, obligated to follow through and to finish all of the things and kind of go through the whole process. And lastly, don't be afraid to experiment, right? So uh, what works for, say, the nonprofit that I was working for would not at all have worked for the software company I was working for, would not at all have worked for um, an internal training tool that I've worked on, right? So be open to kind of trying out different stuff and make sure that you don't lock yourself in to always doing the same thing. So in short, um, set really clear expectations with people to get them to show up. Uh, make sure that you value people's time and efforts appropriately. Explore some non-cash incentives. Um, but if you are going to use cash, do so appropriately. Um, show participants how their feedback had an impact. <coughs> Don't pay longitudinal studies all at once, either before or at the end. And be willing to experiment and switch things up. So again, 
That's, this is a 40 minute session, y'all. Can't, I, I, I'm sure that you feel it just as much as me, and I know that we're just after coffee. So um, kind of to wrap up all the things we've talked about, you really first want to make sure you define who you want to talk to and who you don't want to talk to. Translate those things into a really clear screener, find those people, and then get them to show up so that we can all have more successes. <laughs> Excellent. Um, here are some resources. Oh, sorry. <laughs> here are some resources because I, I skimmed through a lot of stuff that we didn't have time for. Um, I'm certainly happy to share these, and I can send them out as well. Or you can come find me at um, in the lounge, or I'll be around for the next couple of days. So thank you. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful.